You're listening to Florida Matters, I'm Matthew Petty. School board elections have been nonpartisan in Florida since 2000, and that's because voters here approved a constitutional amendment on the issue back in 1998. But now there's a proposal to make school board races partisan again, a constitutional amendment to reverse the one declared, decided 25 years ago. Floridians will get to vote on Amendment 1 in November. And one reason for that may be that in the past four years, school board meetings have gotten a lot more polarized and these county level government agencies are getting a lot more attention from the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. So today you're going to hear from three people who are paying close attention to local school board uh, races and this amendment. Jeff Solacek covers education for the Tampa Bay Times. Thanks for being here, Jeff. Thanks for inviting me. Rod Thompson chairs the Communications Committee with the Sarasota County Republican Party. He's a Republican uh, political strategist. Rod, thank you. Thank you. And Damaris Allen is the Executive Director of Families for Strong Public Schools. Damaris, thank you. Thank you for having me. And just a note about today's uh, Florida Matters too. We are spending a full hour on the conversation and uh, we do have an audience of local residents to join us here today at WUSF's Performance Studio in Tampa. And a bit later in the show, you are going to be hearing questions from some of our audience. Jeff, if this amendment passes, School board elections will become partisan in 2026. In the meantime, races are nonpartisan. So what does that mean for voters? Well, it means that they'll have party labels next to their names starting in 2026, but that doesn't really mean that they don't now. Because even though people are running and put NP and they're not allowed to say, hey, I'm a Democrat, hey, I'm a Republican, they all but do it anyway. And so right now what we're seeing is a lot of partisan electioneering without using the partisan words. Everyone can vote in the primary. So what is turnout like for school board races as it stands? Well, generally speaking, the primaries are when they hold the the school board races and they're not generally as well attended as the general election, but what they have is the ability for everybody to vote from the beginning. So everybody who does show up can participate if they go to party primaries, what happens is the Republicans have their election, the Democrats have their election, and then it moves to the general election, and that's where everybody else can chime in. What about non-party affiliated affiliated candidates? Just like with others now, non-party races, uh, candidates would go to the general election without having a primary. So we have a primary election coming up on August 20th. Pinellas County has elections for school board members in districts one, four, and five. I know this is one of the districts that you cover. So what's happening in those races? Basically what we have is a slate of candidates who are running from the pretty far right. And they basically go to Republican party functions and look for support from there in addition to going door to door knocking. And they're trying to, what they say is flip the board. They want to create a new majority with two more two other board members who got elected two years ago who ran on an essentially Moms for Liberty type uh, campaign and joined them to create a new majority. And we don't know what's going to happen afterwards if they win. But you have two candidates who are incumbents who have been targeted by Ron DeSantis. He named them and said he wants them out. And so we're waiting to see what happens if he puts any money behind that because we know he also is trying to get those amendments defeated. Uh, Pasco County, it's another one of the counties in your uh, wheelhouse, Jeff. There's a school board member to elect in District 4. What about that race? That race doesn't seem to be really as much impacted by these kind of partisan things. Pasco is quite different from Pinellas in a lot of ways. Even though it is a pretty Republican community, it's a pretty moderate, it's become a pretty moderate community compared to some of its neighbors. And so we're really seeing just two people who agree on a lot of things running against each other. So let's talk more about the politicization of school board elections. I mean, you mentioned Pinellas County. Is this kind of something new for Pinellas County as far as what you're seeing over the, you know, your coverage over the years? Well, I mean, I want to I want to take you back a little bit before they had this amendment in 1998. 
right, in 2000, what mm -hmm. happened was they were very heavily, in Pinellas, Republican. And the Republicans wanted to keep control of their board. And so when the amendment came out, there was a lot of pushback against the idea of becoming nonpartisan. But it was argued by some very partisan-minded people. Jay Stanley Marshall, who was the former president of FSU, and he created the organization, the James Madison Institute, which basically drove Jeb Bush's education agenda. Mm -hmm. And he argued that education and schools are a public sacred trust that don't need to have partisanship in them. We need to talk about things in terms of education and not politics, not party politics. And more than two million people in the state of Florida agreed with him. And since then, it's, it's been on a low boil. There are partisan issues that do come up. But after masking happened, people started to fight a lot more and show up a lot more. And we've seen increasingly the push back and forth. And the interesting part is at first it was very conservative people showing up arguing against something. And then the other side started to show up too. And so it, there, it, if anything, there's been great conversations happening at school board meetings that I hadn't seen in a long time. So in some ways it's good. But I mean, yes, it has become much more actively political and argumentative at school boards. So it makes it more interesting from a reporter's point of view. Oh, yes. <laughs> Just coming back to that notion of the primary and closed primaries, uh, um, you know, the races you're describing, that they essentially get decided in August, right? So, I mean, is that the way most school board races work? And uh, are voters aware of how that works? I can't say what voters are aware of. I think they should be. It's been this way for quite some time. But yes, the if there are two candidates running against each other in an election in August, the winner wins, and that's it. It's over. Just sort of like if no, only one person runs, that person runs without ever showing up on the ballot. Now, if you have more than two candidates, there's a chance that nobody gets more than 50%, and then the top two move on to November. And everybody has a chance to participate in all these elections right now because they are nonpartisan. But if they move to a party pr primary, then that dynamic changes. No matter what county uh, these elections are being held in, what, what advice would you give to voters to help decipher who these school board candidates are before they head to the polls on August uh, 20th? Pretty much every sophisticated or serious candidate has a website, social media. They, they publish things on little documents that they bring to your door sometimes, and they lay out pretty pretty clearly right now, more than ever before, exactly what they stand for. Some use code, you know, some try and hide or, or pretend like they stand for something that they don't. But for the most part, you can, at this point, know what they're saying. And if you don't do your background research, at least enough to know, do they support this or that, then you're walking in blind. But most people lay it out pretty clearly. I'm for this, or I'm really against that. And if you haven't done your research yet and you're a voter, you've only got a couple weeks left really to get that research in, right? Well, you have until August 20th, so you have a month. So um, what are candidates this year saying about their political affiliation or, or lack of it? It's interesting. I went to one forum where one candidate stood up and said, I really want to tell you I'm a Republican, but I'm not supposed to. And so the law doesn't allow me to do this. And so I have to tell people I'm no party. And it's really hard because I really want to identify as who I am kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, and by the same token, I saw another candidate on social media who said, all these people ask me, are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? Are you going to vote for Trump? Are you going to vote for Biden? He says, I'm running for this race because I'm for education. I'm not affiliated with the party and I don't want to be affiliated with the party, if this were a partisan election, I wouldn't even be running. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. Jeff, you've got the long view, and you gave us a little bit of the history of partisan school board elections going back to when they were partisan and the amendment which subsequently passed and made them nonpartisan. How would this amendment change school board elections if it passes? Well, I mean, basically, you would know who's a Republican and who's a Democrat very specifically and plainly. Aside from that, it might add some extra money into campaigns because right now the parties kind of surreptitiously give money to people, but they're not supposed to like infuse campaigns with, with their money. They're, but a lot of other things won't change. I mean, the Republican Party and the Democrat Party still have, for instance, 
campaign forums for the candidates, and they only allow the ones who are registered in their party to show up. And things like that already happen. You still have candidates who come to your door and say, hi, I'm a nonpartisan candidate running for school board, and let me give you this packet from the people who are in my party, and you can see how they're running in other races, and maybe you can vote for all of them. So there's a lot of that already happening. So it's, I'm, I'm more interested in what's going to happen now that term limits are in effect, which was a trade-off a year before we got this. Mm -hmm. uh, they tried to do nonpartisan elections or partisan elections at that point in 2022, and there was a huge pushback. And so they said, okay, let's just do term limits instead. Well, let's talk more about what's happening in November. And Rod Thompson, you support this amendment to make school board elections partisan. Why is that? Uh, a few reasons. If I could just add my bio just a smidgen there is that I was a reporter at newspapers for almost 25 years. Actually, Jeff and I overlapped at the Sarasota Herald June for a few years. So I'm much longer as a newspaper person than as a political consultant. I've been a political consultant for 12 years. I just want to put that caveat in there. I'm not a lifelong political hack. That's a more recent thing. Um, so the reason I support it is very simple. It's, it's kind of first principles, and that's transparency. The more information voters have, the better informed they are to make decisions. And when you have a nonpartisan race, particularly when you have the race being heavily partisan, as Jeff pointed out, in reality on the ground, then you're just hiding information from voters. I think it's a... I think transparency is always the best policy. More information is always the best policy. Um, the more, the better. And the fact is, when you said what will change, nothing's going to change to speak of because it's already been partisan. If you take Sarasota County, which I'm most familiar with, and I covered a school board there for three years before Jeff was doing it, um, it, w it used to be the races would be like eight or ten or twelve thousand dollars for a race for school board. But I will say those school boards were cheerleaders for the administration. There's very little accountability. The administration ran the schools that was let the professionals do it, et cetera. And the school board, like says, we have the best teachers in the world. We have the best school. We have the best students and all. Okay, but that's not what the scores are showing. What's going on here? And so what's changed now is in the past years before the COVID shutdowns and the masking, what changed was we started seeing a lot more of an agenda in the schools that people could see. And you started seeing a lot more response to that agenda that conservatives were not thrilled with at all for the children. And so what happened then is you started seeing a lot more money and partisanship in it. And now, I mean, I don't know what it'll be this cycle, but um, last cycle in 2022, school board races in Sarasota County were a quarter of a million dollars. And that was a lot of that was partisan money raised by the campaigns, packs on both sides, the Democrat Party of Sarasota County, the Republican Party of Sarasota County, PACs and super PACs, dark money, all of it on both sides flooded into that. All this does is it says, okay, we're going to be honest now. We're just going to tell you what has been going on for many cycles now. We're going to put an R and a D next to the name. And the reason why I think that's very helpful is that there are busy people. I live in a subdivision, pretty middle class subdivision in Sarasota, and a lot of families, those parents are not out there researching in depth, the issues to understand each issue, where each candidate stands on issues, starting from president, going to Senate, going to members of Congress, mm -hmm. going to their legislators, going to their county commissioners, then going to school boards. It just can't happen. And if you have an R, you have a pretty good identifier of a worldview. And if you have a D, you have a pretty good identifier of a worldview. And I know that's not a perfect world to live in, where people will just vote based on that. But otherwise, they're voting still in that race based on more ignorance. So to me, this is clarifying what is already happening and being honest and transparent. And it gives voters, particularly busy voters, more information. Damaris, your organization does not support the amendment. So why is that? We need less politics in our schools and not more. We need to focus on kids. We need to focus on their education and ensuring that they are successful. We need to focus on making sure our schools are preparing our students for life, um, making sure that they're ready to work and, and live in this economy. Um, 
this is going to add more money into races, which is going to put it out of reach for a lot of good people that should be running for school boards, who understand the budget, who have kids in public schools, who know the actual issues that parents are facing, who are on the ground. And we don't want to make our school board elections unreachable for those people. But as Rod was pointing out, there is already quite a lot of money swirling around and a lot of party interest from both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party in these school board races as it stands. Yeah, and I would counter with two wrongs don't make a right, right? We need to we need to move in a different direction with our school boards, right? We need to make them less partisan. We need to move away from that and not encourage the inf- infusion of that additional funding. That isn't going to have our be- our kids' best interests at heart. Also, the idea that an R or a D clarifies how people feel is completely inaccurate as far as education goes. If you look at rural Republicans, they'll have one view versus uh, urban Republicans versus rural Democrats. There are Democrats who are for school choice. There are Democrats who are against school choice. And the same thing is true of Republicans. So I think school boards are the one place where it's it's an exception. And I would also argue judicial races as well, that we should m- keep partisanship out of it and keep it fo- focused on the issues at hand. Jeff, what are you hearing from people in the community about what school boards do and the responsibilities of school board members? Most people honestly don't know a lot about school boards beyond what their kids go to school. And I can tell you just tied to nothing almost. I was at a, I was at a school one time waiting for my kid to pick him up. The superintendent had just gotten fired by the school board. I'm making all these calls around. The parents around me say, what are you doing? And I said, I'm, I'm looking into the superintendent getting fired. They said, the superintendent of what? So I, I mean, I think there are a lot of people who don't know what school boards do. When you go to budget hearings, when they are approving billion dollar budgets, almost nobody shows up. They have public hearings on things like the student code of conduct, setting the rules for how your children are supposed to behave and what's expected of them. Almost nobody shows up. So I'm I'm not convinced that they know a lot about the school board or necessarily that they care. What they want is to see that the teachers are in the classroom teaching their kids and that their kids are learning something. What about voters' perceptions of how school board races are run? I mean, it sounds like from your perspective, Jeff, it may be a little bit hard to divine what voters think of this amendment, but from the folks that you have talked to about it, what do they think will change? (laughs) <laughs> That's a hard question. Um, both of the speakers, to my left and to my right, have raised points that I've heard out there. And some people think that you should be transparent, but they don't like the idea necessarily of losing the opportunity to vote. <sighs> Tons of people will be pulled away from the primary. They won't get a chance to to choose. And that was a big argument that killed that vote, that legislation in 2022. Mm-hmm. Other people say, you know, we definitely do or don't need these labels for whatever reason. So yeah, it is hard to divine who's going to do what at the end of the day. But I look at it this way. When this amendment passed, was it 25 years ago, you said? We had a very different Florida than we have right now. And, and it's hard to guess anymore what people are thinking and doing. I, I hate to say that. I, I used to know. I used to have like a gut check reaction. It's like I can tell what's going to happen in this election. It's become very difficult to do that these days. We're getting close to a break, but Rod, just in in 30 seconds or so, uh, that notion of kind of closed primaries, um, you you say that wouldn't really change too much, but what about that? Well, that would would be a technical change for sure. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you had that, you'd have, you know, only Democrats could vote for Democrats, Republicans vote for Republicans, which I think, why would Democrats want Republicans to vote for their standard bearer and vice versa? That doesn't make any sense. It never has that we have open primaries. I don't know why states do that. But I will say, I think that you will see more people voting, filling in the oval for uh, school board candidates if it's held in November than the much lower turnout percentage of voters if it's held in August. Damaris, um, your thoughts on that? I mean, it sounds like the the notion of kind of shutting some folks out from that primary would be something you wouldn't support? Correct. Yes, it would me- remove people further from the decision that is being made. It would ensure that they w- their voices weren't heard in the same way. And I, I think, you know, in my lifetime, we have only had 
nonpartisan school board elections. And I think there's a lot of people who take that for granted. And I think there's a lot of especially young people who this is going to impact. And we should we should definitely think about that. If you look at young people and their registration to vote, the vast majority, a lot of them aren't choosing a party. And so the people closest to being impacted by that decision are the ones that are going to lose their voice. Uh, Rod, I mean, there are a lot more NPA uh, voters in Florida now than there were when the, this amendment originally passed back in uh, you know 25 years ago. So that obviously changes the landscape too. It does. And so if you want to be an MPA, um, I try and tell this to people all the time. So they say, I don't want to be partisan. I don't want to be part of a party. Okay. But that means in all the other races, you can't vote in a primary. So you only get to vote in November. If you feel more towards a Democrat or more towards a Republican, probably should register there. Then you get a voice twice, both in the primary and in the general. I mean, I, I think most people are, really Jeff said it, they're really not that informed on that particular issue and, and all the you know, minuscule functionalities of the election and voting. You're listening to Florida Matters and a conversation about the Amendment 1 on the ballot in November, which will require members of a district school board to be elected in a partisan election rather than a non-partisan election. We're coming to you from the WSF Performance Studio in Tampa. Jeff Solichek is with us covering election for the Tampa Bay Times. Rod Thompson, political consultant and a member of the Republican Party of Sarasota County. And Damaris Allen, executive director of Families for Strong Public Schools based in Hillsborough County. We'll talk more about how this amendment would change school boards when we come back. You're listening to Florida Matters live from the WUSF Performance Studio in Tampa. I'm Matthew Petty. And with us, Republicans, political strategist Rod, Rod Thompson, Damaris Allen, Executive Director of Families for Strong Public Schools, and Tampa Bay Times education reporter Jeff Solichek. Jeff, school board meetings can be a bit raucous. We talked about that before the break, but they weren't always like this, right? So what were school board meetings like that you covered, at least, before the pandemic? There were years of me listening to school board members talk and listening to superintendents give reports and nobody from the public coming to say anything. Maybe a teacher or two who was upset about something. Occasionally something would rile people up and have them show up. And usually it was like, don't fire my librarian or something like that. And then um, lots of awards. They would bring in kids and say, congratulations for doing a great job. And we would get to go home early. <laughs> so things changed in 2020, right? When did that start to change? Well, I mean, right around then people started to get upset, but they couldn't come to board meetings because everything was held remotely. And so there was still, you, you knew there was upset out there, but it was when they reopened the board meetings and people started coming and screaming. I, I knew it was different when I was at a Pinellas County School Board meeting and there was a little, I think she was eight or nine years old, and she went up with her mom and she looked at the school board and she says, hi, my name is whatever. And she was very peaceful. And she says, and you hate children. And I think you all should be going to jail for being child abusers. And she started screaming at them. And the board members stared at her like, are you actually doing this? And her mom is going like, yeah, you go, t you tell her. And that's when you kind of knew that this was, we were in a new place. Mm -hmm. And just kind of refresh the memory here how far after the start of the pandemic was this was it still 2020 or was it not until 2021 I, I, months but not a year mm -hmm. i mean whenever they reopened the board meetings again and every board did it a little differently and so some stayed remote longer than others i can't remember the exact time frame i'm sorry so uh, you mentioned moms for liberty uh, before the break when did they emerge on the scene gosh was it 2021? I think that's when it was, when they all showed up and, and we never heard of them before. I mean, I knew the players because I knew them all because they were all former school board members from Florida and and they were reaching out to people who I'd really never heard their voices before. And so it was interesting to hear who they were, but when they held their conference in Tampa, uh, downtown Tampa, and we were all there, their first annual conference, and all of them, people came from all over. There were about 500 people there and they had Ron DeSantis as their guest speaker, and they had some interesting speeches there. And and the outside, the Democrats were having their, their statewide convention, too. And so there was a lot of rallies and protests, and things have just sort of taken off from there. Mm -hmm. Rod, when did political parties start paying more attention to school board races? And I guess, you know, from your perspective as a former newspaper editor, I guess you've got that slightly longer view. So uh, is it 
kind of misstating the facts to say there's more interest now or has it always been this way? Oh gosh, no, it's definitely more interest now. A lot more interest now. Um, it was, I mean, it, there's always just sleepy board meetings. And again, I, I described it before. They were nothing. I, I didn't see a school board that was at all accountable to voters or holding staff accountable. They're just cheerleaders. Um, and that continued for quite a while. And like we had people like Janice and me, um, who was chairman, just the nicest lady in the world. Um, but she was, I don't know, she must have been on the board for 20 years or something, you know, and there was never going to be any change. So I would say I got, I got hired in my first school board race in 2016. Um, and that's when I really started seeing what had been burbling beneath the surface for a while among groups, you know, was really starting to rise to the surface to the point where, all right, we're going to start fielding candidates here. And that candidate won. Um, and from just, just to clarify, when you say you got hired, you mean as a political consultant, yes, right? Yes, as a political. So I'm not in newspapers anymore. Mm -hmm. Got my own consultancy, and I was hired just to help with some messaging because I had a long history with school boards and good at messaging. So um, that was, I would say, the beginning was there. Now, publicly, publicly facing was the pandemic and the response to the pandemic, um, but there was a lot of groundswell before that. So that was organic but it wasn't instantly organic there was a lot of stuff happening before that the the members of the moms for liberty knew each other before they formed it matter of fact there was an alternative to the florida school boards association that these ladies were part of creating which ended up going defunct um, and they then they shifted over to the moms for liberty that was years and years before that so um, this has been going on for a while and it was missed by the public, missed by a lot of the media, probably less so by Jeff as an expert in the area, but missed by a lot of the media. And it was the great revealer was when kids had to stay home and parents started seeing what was they were being taught. And this is more nationally than maybe in my county, although certainly happened in my county too. Then you started seeing the eruption of parents saying, what in the world is going on in my schools? Now, from my perspective, that's always a parent responsibility. Shame on you for not knowing that all right, and along. That, I mean, that's something you'll hear from teachers and educators too. Is like we've always been open and we've always welcomed comment from from parents into you know what what uh, has been taught in schools. But um, I guess the pandemic did shine more of a light on it. Right. I think there's a lot of good teachers out there that always welcomed it, and I think that there are some teachers that didn't, and that's come to light too. Honestly, even ridiculous social media like TikTok and all is a great revealer because people just out themselves on what they're doing. And some of it's just fringe stuff, and I don't care about the fringe stuff. But there are, there are those that have been having an agenda, and they didn't want parents to see. Um, and so there needs to be an accountability all the way through the system that hasn't existed previous to the late 20-teens that maybe is starting to exist now. Like I tell you, I think it's going to be messy to mm -hmm. get to a good accountability, and maybe it will always stay messy if we're going to hold everybody accountable for what they're doing. Where does the Sarasota Republican Party stand on Mums for Liberty? Like, does the party endorse them? No. I mean, we don't, we don't endorse the organization, um, and um, we, don't, um, we don't endorse candidates if there's more than one Republican running. However, um, to what was mentioned earlier, the party will participate in school board races with money. We don't, we don't, we don't give to a campaign. But we can send out our own flyers. We can do our own text messaging, um, robocalling. We can do whatever we want to spend money on. We're, not, we're only going to do some because the campaigns and the PACs raise a lot. But the parties can. And, and, the, and the Democrats do it, too. And they are very well funded, too. Um, you know, I'm familiar with ours, but I'm very aware of what they're doing in Sarasota County. And this is just a heavyweight boxing match between the parties and the PACs that represent both sides. Hmm. So is that the way it should be? I mean, do you think that's good for the school board? Um, I think so. It has to be. Um, r rather than saying what's ideal, I think we should live in Reelsville and say what has to be. And what has to be is you have to let people identify who they are. The voters need to know everything possible about them. Sometimes that won't come through the media like I wish it would. Sometimes that needs to be done through the campaigns and all. And then voters can make their decision. There were races in Venice last year that were just city races, a lot of negative advertising, and the Republicans lost in a Republican, heavily Republican area because re voter, voters recoil at the negative. So that doesn't always work either. So that I think that positive messaging is really helpful and good too. So I think it has to be the case that voters should know 
everything about who they're voting for. Demiris, I wanted to bring you into this conversation. I mean, what's your impression been of, of um, school board meetings in the last four years? I think we need to be really cautious when we equate conflict with accountability. And I think that's what's happening a lot. There is a lot of conflict in our school board meetings, but it is not a lot of accountability. If you look at what people are talking about, they're not talking about real issues facing our schools. We're not talking about the lack of funding. We're not talking about the, the facilities that are falling apart. We're not talking about the lack of teachers in classrooms, the inclusion of lots of students that have long-term stubs and are being held accountable by test scores. None of those things are being discussed. It's these hot topic issues that are almost non-existent in our schools that gain all of the time. And so we're not dealing with the real issues that are impacting our kids. Also, we need to remember our kids are watching. As a parent, I am appalled by the behavior, and let me be clear, on both sides at school board meetings. I would never tolerate my child behaving that way, and I do not want the people who are leading to, to sh and, and, and being examples for my kids to show them that bad example. We are not raising a generation of kids based on our example that can talk across party aisles and work in the best interest of all people. I'm very concerned about the hyper-focus on partisanship because the goal should be to serve the people who elected you, not your party, not your own self-interest, but the people who elected you. And that's what I love about school boards is they have the ability, because they serve of a smaller number of people to meet with the people they serve, to go into the schools that they serve, and to understand the real needs and issues that are facing the people on the ground. Can I agree with Damaris on a point? <laughs> sure. Can I jump in but here? Because, because I totally agree that, that we, you don't equate conflict with accountability at all. And certainly on both sides, definitely on my side, there's been way too much of people shouting ridiculous statements, making accusations, throwing comments out there. And that got going really big um, against Tom Edwards, and I thought it was wrong. Mm. But then people on his side come in, and they've been every meeting doing the opposite thing. So you None of that is beneficial. You're saying it's kind of like an arms race, essentially. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, but there's no mutually assured destruction in place. Right. Um, so um, I, I think all of that is unacceptable. I mean, I just cringe at the whole thing. They're almost unwatchable at times. I, I do want to say that a lot of the school board meetings are not like this. And a lot of them are just talking about what do our test scores look like? How are we going to build the new schools to greet the new incoming students and mm -hmm. that are coming in huge numbers and things like that? A lot of this stuff happens, even though it gets a lot of attention from me too, because you know what's more interesting: a, a book banning by some school board member who decided that it was pornographic, or somebody coming in and saying like our test scores went up by one percent. You know what's going to get attention but but a lot of the conversations are still unanimous votes they are probably 95 percent unanimous votes on a lot of things that are happening that are just doing business of the school district for kids and for teachers and for everybody else who works in the districts and so i, I just don't want to get lost in the conversations like yes it's partisan yes there's lots of screaming and yelling but there's still some good things that are going on out there that are ignored by me and others because they're just not interesting. Mm -hmm. Damaris, let me just kind of throw a hypothetical out there. I mean, it sounds like there is some consensus sometimes, even though there is a lot of polarization in some school boards. But, you know, for example, you had a divided school board where people had a D or a, a, an R next to their name, but you were able to come to consensus. Would that be a good thing? I mean, when you talk about coming, you know, talking across the aisles, is that the goal? Yes. Yeah. I, I think a, a balance of power always is good for the people, right? I, I'm, I'm a person who believes firmly in that. Um, and I think having conversations across the aisle, finding moments of agreement are very important. What I'm concerned about in our current political environment is it becomes, this is my party, this is where I'm staying, and I'm not going to cross the aisle and meet you in the middle. And that is where I have a great deal of concern. And I'd like to keep that out of our school boards as long as possible. For a very long time, I have enjoyed, I, we have enjoyed being able to meet with a school board member regardless of party affiliation. That is no longer the case. In the last few years, school board members will not meet with people that are not of their same party, even if they have kids in their district. And that is incredibly problematic. And I'm concerned that this will perpetuate that problem and not fix it. I wanted to ask about your organization too, Damaris. How did that start? 
Um, so it started during COVID. Interestingly enough, we saw a lot of parents being concerned about what was going on in uh, school board meetings and what's happening with education. And what we wanted to do was give them information to share with them what was happening where things are happening a lot of people think oh our schools don't have funding that's a local school board issue well it's really a state issue so we really wanted them to to help them understand what the issues were we do a lot of listening sessions so we spend a lot of time listening to parents and and finding out what their concerns are and then directing them as to where they can go to advocate to make things better for their kids mm -hmm. Rod, uh, in 2022, and again this year, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis endorsed some school board candidates in the area counties, including Sarasota. Do you think this is having an influence on the push for partisan races and the latest push? Uh, I guess I don't know if it's a chicken or egg thing, to be honest. I don't know which came first. I think that there's been a lot of discussion. I don't know how many times there's been a bill in the legislature to try and reverse the 2020 um, amendment, but a number of times. So this has always been kind of out there as a desire. I think having DeSantis and his popularity and his influence behind it helps it a lot. His being willing to play in school board races um, that just hasn't been the traditional norm um, brings certain issues to the light. So, But I don't think that he started this at all. I think this was train was on the track before him, but he does lend weight to it. Mm -hmm. Jeff, thinking about the job for school board members, and you mentioned term limits, which is obviously a, a change, but other than that, what has changed in, in the way the job is done or the, I guess the responsibilities for school board members over the last few years? Nothing. <laughs> they have the same job that they've always had. It's just a matter of how they choose to do it. Mm -hmm. And just how, how does that work, though? I mean, when you when you think about the sort of polarization, I guess the level of scrutiny on school board members, does that sort of change the way they, they go about what they do? I think that some school board members have become a little more reticent to say things than they had been in the past. And I think some are more willing than ever to say exactly what they think. It's just kind of they're, they're gauging who's listening. Mm -hmm. But the big things that they have to do is adopt a budget, uh, approve policies, and... They're responsible for, sort of, for hiring and firing, although mostly it's just the superintendent in, in the uh, districts that appoint a superintendent. But it's really just the same job that they've ever had. It's just a matter of how seriously they take it, who they want to listen to, and what they want to say. And is there a difference between school board members who are elected more recently, like in more recent election cycles, and maybe board members who have been there longer? Not really. I... I think the new school board members have always been more reticent to say things just when they come on the board simply because they are um, new and they don't know everything. Although I've seen in other counties that I don't cover, I've read about them where they've just come on gangbusters. Like Rod said, they came on and they fired a superintendent. And that's not just one district. It's several districts. They came on and on the first day before they even really had a chance to understand what was going on in the district, they said, and did they have a meeting beforehand where they did the, where they had this this is a question that always has come up to me how do you know on your first meeting you're going to fire the superintendent unless you've discussed it previously mm -hmm. but they came in they fired superintendents they overruled policies they got rid of people and they said this is the new world order and so i'm i i work in a district or two districts where basically the new people came on and they weren't in a majority, they couldn't really do very much, so they're sitting back and biding their time and doing the things that they do. But there are other districts where the majorities came in and they flipped over and they were a lot more vocal and they did a lot of stuff. And some people would call it chaos and damage and some people would call it riding the ship and, and it just sort of depends on your perspective. Well, we are going to continue the conversation in a moment. You're listening to Florida Matters. We're live from the WUSF Performance Studio in Tampa talking about a proposed amendment to switch from nonpartisan to partisan school board elections and what that means for public schools. You'll hear more from our panelists, Rod Thompson, Damaris Allen, and Jeff Solacek, and questions from our studio audience when we return. You're listening to Florida Matters, and we're live from the WUSF Performance Studio in Tampa talking about a proposed amendment to switch from nonpartisan to partisan school board elections and what that means for public schools. Our panelists are Republican political strategist Rod Thompson, Damaris Allen, Executive Director of Families for Strong Public Schools, and Tampa Bay Times education reporter Jeff Solacek. And we're going to take some questions from the audience now. Um, Mary Shedden from WSF is going to uh, call you up. 
uh, when you do come up and grab your card, I'd like you just to introduce yourself into the microphone, then read your question, and then we'll go from there. I'm Greg, retiree from St. Pete, and I'd like to know that if you uh, make this a partisan um, operation, how is it going to help increase uh, teacher pay and student outcome? Good question. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, let's just kind of go through the, the line here. Damaris, what are your thoughts on that? Um, that's a state legislative issue. Uh, teacher pay, the funding for that comes from that, unless you're voting on a local referenda to increase um, increase your uh, local uh, millage. Um, so it probably won't, with one exception. Um, one Sometimes one party leans against having local referenda, so it may impact your ability to vote on local referenda. But like I said, it's not across the board. Mm -hmm. Jeff, your thoughts? Uh, I'm just going to second that. I know I'm covering the Pinellas County School Board race where they are having a referendum on their ballot this year to increase taxes for teacher pay. And there are two of the three candidates who are running who would identify themselves as Republican who have made very clear that they don't support increased taxes and probably would not support the referendum and may not have gotten to the ballot if they had been on the board. Rod. Um, I don't know that I see a big change in it. In Sarasota County, uh, we just had it again, the full two mil passed. It passes every time like l literally 80, 20 or worse than that. I mean, higher than that. Sorry, not worse, higher than that. Um, and every Republican on the board voted to put it on I'm sorry, I think every Republican, I think it was unanimous, to put it to a referendum, and they have every cycle. Mm -hmm. Oh, he asked about student outcome, too. Sure. Um, so that is such a big question, and, a, a, you know, I mean, it's a huge, that's what I guarantee you, Damaris and I agree on 100%, is we want to improve student outcome. Um, I like to say in Sarasota County, we have had, in the last two years, with a change in focus on reading and getting rid of some other things, um, we had the biggest increase in the state, or one of the largest increases, a very large nine percentage point increase in third grade reading scores. Um, that was a big success. So, I mean, that's just one sort of anecdotal data point. Doesn't mean anything for sure. Um, my guess is it's still gonna come down to the quality of the decisions made by the school board. Damaris, any connection that you could see between student outcome and uh, partisan or nonpartisan school board elections? I think we underestimate the power that the legislature has in all of these decisions and then the power of the State Board of Education in guiding all of these things. Um, I think the amount of testing hurts our student outcome because it has drastically increased over the last uh, few years since we moved to fast testing, which was supposed to be more. I mean, less testing, not more. Um, so I, I, I don't know that this will have that big of an impact, but that also it's a big question. Mm. Okay. Hi, I'm Kennedy, a high schooler from Sarasota. Recently, in a Sarasota County Commission race, the candidate had her campaign manager's daughter file as a write-in candidate against her rival from the same party. If this amendment comes to fruition, how can we ensure similar political gamesmanship does not affect our school board races? That's a good question. Rod, what do you think about that? Can't answer it. Um, that, so as long as we have closed primaries, both parties are going to play the game of if they have a majority in, an, in, a, in a county or in a district, they're going to want a closed race. So they'll find somebody to do it. Not a big fan of that, but that is, that's the reality. That's what's going to happen because otherwise, if it's an open one, then you have, say in Sarasota County, uh, voter registration is 151,000 and some Republican, 88,000 and some Democrat. That's a big gap in Sarasota County. Um, 89,000, I think, MPAs. I think they're a smidge ahead of Democrats, but they're about the same. Um, so Republicans don't want Democrats to be able to vote in a primary because why would we want them um, you know, helping choose our standard bearer, our candidate? Mm. I suspect Broward and West Palm would have a same view, opposite parties for the same reason, though. Jeff, just thinking about gamesmanship in elections, I mean, do you see a lot of that in school board races, or have you? I have seen it in, like, a superintendent's race. They still elect the superintendent in in Pasco County, and it is a partisan race, and I've seen it happen there. And I, I just want to point out that at the same time that the voters approved the nonpartisan school board elections, they also approved the ability to open up the primaries where there's only two Republicans or two Democrats or whatever, and there's nobody else running in any other place. That intention was to allow for voters to participate in these races. It was supposed to be about fair elections, and we have seen lots of gamesmanship. This is the example that he just gave is just one in the county, but 
it does happen. And until they change the law, because they've been asked to change the law numerous times, it, it can continue to happen. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's move on. Um, hi, my name is Nicole Volkavich. I'm a recent graduate of a Suncoast Polytechnical High School in Sarasota County. Uh, my question would be, with many conservative-leaning school boards instituting new for-profit charter and private schools, um, in counties like mine, Sarasota, and knowing the facts behind how these disenfranchise minorities, what would Florida's plan to institute partisan school boards do to curb this sort of disenfranchisement? Let me let me take that question, I guess, and sort of uh, break it down into two parts there. Uh, thinking about the bigger picture of um, of charter schools, Jeff, your thoughts on, on what this amendment may do to influence that or, or not? I think this is a question similar to the one about how do you influence what's going on with student outcomes as a result of par- political party, and and it's gonna it's gonna range depending on where you are and and what the state does, what the school board reacts to it, what the state board does, what the legislature does. I don't know that I don't feel like I could answer that question right now. There's just so many variables, mm-hmm. but I'm sure it could have some influence somewhere. But until we see it. I'm not sure what it would be. Uh, Rod, disenfranchisement, I mean, is that some a, a sort of side effect that you see from charter schools? Um, well, no, particularly if we have a robust voucher program. I realize that doesn't make a lot of people happy, but that does help minorities. When you have vouchers that follow a child, then poor moms in Miami-Dade and others um, of any color can have a way out of disastrous schools for their children. Without vouchers, without an opportunity to move from that school, we are locking them in failing schools and we're locking them in a failing cycle for generation after generation. That's just unconscionable to do that. But vouchers, where the dollars follow the child, empowers the mom or the parents with their children to be able to get them into a better school. And if the answer is, well, we just need to pay teachers more, data doesn't show that. I don't think it changes that. I think the, the parents that are engaged enough to want their children out of those schools will get the vouchers, will be able to, and will have an avenue out. Yeah, I think the voucher conversation may be something we'd have to continue another time. But Damaris, let me get your take on this. Um, so to the point of charters, I think it's important to recognize that, this, that there is now a charter review commission. So the school local school board doesn't even have to approve the charters. They can completely bypass that and go to the charter review commission. That was something that was done in the legislature. So it's really important to recognize when local control is being removed by the legislature and put in the hands of, of others. Um, I, to the voucher thing, can I just say one thing? 70% of voucher students are existing private school students. It does not change, it does not help um, the, the people it was intended to help. If it did, then you wouldn't have to have no income cap where millionaires could get it. Also, it's it's the vast majority of students return to public schools and have a greater learning loss than COVID. Happy to provide the data on that. Okay, let's uh, move on. Thank you all so much for being here. Brant Robinson, I teach social studies and history over in Pinellas County. Um, Do you think that partisan school board races and elections will increase the likelihood of politically motivated disinformation being inserted into our curriculum? And how would you advise that we guard against that? Thank you. Well, Jeff, let me let me punt that question to you. Disinformation and and curriculum. What what are your thoughts on that? I, Mr. Robinson knows a lot more about that than I do. He's a teacher in the classroom, and I've, I've written about him, and I know that he has been very able to not be forced to do that. Uh, and I think that the way that some of those laws are written are in a way that, that school boards can control the curriculum, though. And we've seen where they've adopted or not adopted books as a result of things that are or are not in them. Just recently, the Orlando Sentinel had a story just this week talking about how the state sent an, a, I guess, I haven't seen any of the information myself, but they sent information to authors of science textbooks saying, if you put climate change in there, we are not gonna take your book. So disinformation, misinformation, um, just curving the curriculum a certain direction can and has happened. And if we have partisan school boards I don't know how much it would change because a lot of these school boards, no matter what their partisanship is, they have been adopting books that only come with approval from the state because they are often afraid of what will happen if they don't. Damaris. 
Yeah, I would agree with that. I think we have a system set up to uh, that is scaring people into submission to to not put books in that may be questioned. And there's a financial implication, right? Like if you don't go along with this, your your school district could be sued and then you're on the hook for the funding for this, which hurts students, right? Ultimately. And so I think I think we are we are are taking away opportunities from our students when we should be equipping them to think critically how to ask difficult questions about the curriculum that's being placed in front of them. That's what really prepares them, not giving them a set uh, set of thinking and asking them to think and regurgitate. Rod. Right. Um, this information is, um, it seems to become more and more of a bit of an opinion definition um, which is disinformation and mis misinformation. We can just, you know, do the, do the um, Russian dossier and that, you know, that whole thing with the 51 um, security people who said that it that the Hunter Biden laptop had all of the hallmarks of Russian disinformation, right. which it turns out was 100% wrong. So the the idea that there could be disinformation is like, well, maybe it's disinformation, maybe it's not. But this is why. See, I wouldn't have any problem on. I think the, the example you gave. Let's present both of these theories that are both, um, you know, have a substantial amount of support in our country, or maybe it's just school board by school board within the community. But you can have a discussion on both um, uh, things that are controversial and haven't been taught, but can be included, and things that have traditionally been taught. You can present both. I think that's exactly how you get to the sort of um, critical thinking skills where students aren't given just one thing, this is what's true, this is what you need to believe, this is what it is, but here, there's this, and people believe this, here, this is why, there's this, people believe this, and this is why. Let's discuss what makes sense to you and have open conversations. That creates a critical thinking, and we don't do very much of that in the public schools, at least in my experience. Okay, let's uh, keep going. Hey folks, I'm Anya, I'm a Sarasota resident and a graduate of Pineview School. My question for y'all is, I'm wondering how you believe this amendment is going to influence student achievement and the resources available to our students, given that Florida has been falling in rank since the unprecedented 2022 gubernatorial endorsements, and also that we now rank 50th for teacher pay in the country. Thank you for your question. Okay, so I, I kind of feel like we have addressed some of this, but let's just go back to it. Um, so Damaris, you, your thoughts on that? I mean. Is there a direct connection between this amendment and, and kind of the impact on some of those things that uh, listener was talking about? Yeah, I, I, I think there is a direct impact, right? Because it's infusing more partisanship. It's, 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 it's encouraging lo loyalty to a party over loyalty to the people. And that to me is always problematic. That's what we see in Tallahassee when they're making decisions around legislation and especially when it comes to education. I do wanna touch on the teacher pay piece a little bit because what's so obscene about that is that for starting teacher salaries, we're at the middle of the road. So our teacher's pay is so horrible that the veteran teacher pay pulls the average teacher pay down to 50th. So while our starting teacher pay is decently ranked nationally, our veterans, we don't appreciate the people who have been in the classroom the longest, who have the most experience with students, who understand how to deal with the challenges they're facing and have a deep understanding of the curriculum. We don't recognize that, that and that is problematic for students. Yeah, Jim. I'd, I'd like to add on to that in a different way, though, because that is a state issue that Damaris mentions. But when I'm in local school boards, and it doesn't matter whether they are Republican, Democrat, left, right, whatever, I hear almost unanimous support for giving teachers and employees as much as they can. That is why they basically support these referendums in a large manner, even in Sarasota County by huge percentages, in Pinellas County by huge percentages. And and they're, they don't want to lose that money. They want to give it to the teachers. Sometimes they talk about where they can cut in other places. And that sometimes takes away from maybe your gifted program that you mentioned or some of the other things that they have in place, if they're willing to touch that. But mm -hmm. they talk about making cuts. And when teachers get paid and, and employees get paid maybe 80 to 85 percent of an entire school district general operating budget, they have to look el elsewhere. And that's where maybe some of these party decisions might be played. But when it comes to this idea of paying teachers, paying employees, 
it seems to be where everybody at least says they agree. So I mean, my, to me, the teacher pay, uh, well, if it's 50th, then it's always been low, but if it's 50th, is far less important than the student scores, in which I think we're in the 20s, which means that we're actually doing pretty well. 20s isn't the best, but we're doing pretty well for a, a state that has very large metropolitan areas that usually make things more difficult for high test scores. Can't be Iowa, um, but we do pretty well. So to me, if we're talking about student outcome, test scores are what matter, not teacher pay so much. Having said that, just right, these things pass all the time when they're, you know, and Republicans support them. You've had DeSantis every year giving billions of dollars more to teachers, if not every year, almost every year, a couple billion more, a couple billion more, a couple billion more. Seems like a lot of money Republicans are spending on teacher pay, so I'm not sure how it being partisan would negatively impact that, and I'd be far more interested in the student score outcomes. Yeah, uh, I, I know we've got more questions. I just wanted to go to you, Jeff, for a moment. I saw you just kind of shaking your head there on the on the numbers. I mean, there is there is more money going towards teachers, there's, sure. But there is definitely more money going towards teachers from the state, but it's been approximately $250 million more a year, not billions. It's been a, com a cumulative billions, but each year, you know, they add an additional amount. So let's say you started with 250 million, you had 250 million more. Now you're at 750 million, but it's not billions more. It's just, right. it's a cumulative effect. Okay, well, let's keep going. Hello, my name is Mitzi Escalante and I'm a resident of Sarasota and I've gone all my school years there. Um, considering the disenfranchisement of youth by partisan politics, what impact does the explicit integration of politic parties in school board elections have on youth participation in school board elections and decision making? So this is really important to me. I have two college students. Uh, one voted for the first time in the last election. The other one will vote for the first time in this election. One, even though he knows it's a closed primary, refuses to register with a party. Um, and that's that should be his right as a citizen, right? And he should still have access for the ability to, to vote in a school board race. And now this is a kid who can hear the sound of a voice of a school board member in Hillsborough and tell you who it is because they are that engaged. And that is a kid that grew up in these school the school systems that wouldn't have the ability to use his voice in this election in the way that he should be able to. So I think it's incredibly problematic. We should be encouraging students to get engaged, to get their friends to vote, to text their friends to vote, to go out and vote in school board elections, to talk about the issues that are facing them and ask the candidates about where they stand on those issues and not pushing them out of the ability to vote in these primaries. Uh, Rod, quickly, do you see that level of disenfranchisement happening at the youth level? Not at all. Um, I've seen, um, the, for one thing, almost everything she said except for the voting part, they cannot do all that. Um, and her son does have the right, to, or I'm sorry, your child does have the right um, to um, you know, register as MPA because they registered as MPA. But rights come with consequences and responsibilities, right? It's not always just the right to do whatever and get everything we want. So he has the right, to, your child has the right to. But they, but the, they don't have necessarily the ability to do it in, um, in, in primaries. Then what I've seen at school board meetings is a lot of young people, a lot of members of C are at those school board me meetings, and on the other side of it are there too, very active, very involved. So I don't really see there being a, a downside as far as youth involvement goes. I should just note as well, C stands for Social Equity Through Education, and uh, some of our audience members today are with this organization. It's uh, uh, directed towards youth power building and youth involvement in school board elections. Okay, let's uh, keep going. Hello, everybody. My name is Sebastian Martinez. I'm a graduated student from Booker High School from Sarasota County, Florida. I've attended school board meetings since 2020 and saw the political rhetoric on both sides hijack the conversation around education. Now I organize with C to educate um, people around the school board. What's the best way to communicate to voters how Amendment 1 impacts them, and particularly MPA voters? Jeff, uh, would you like to take that question? Thank you, by the way. Sure. Uh, you need to tell them if they're NPA voters and this thing goes through, they're not going to be participating in the primary elections. If they want to participate in the primary elections, they should vote against this amendment. And it's basically as simple as that. You Or they could choose to join a party and participate in the process knowing that that's just the way it works. I, 
apropos of nothing, when I moved to Florida, I joined a political party because I saw that where I came from before, I didn't have to, but here I did. And now I can participate, but I've always been able to participate in school board elections here. That would change. Um, that's basically what you need to tell them. Okay, we are sort of running pretty close to time, but we'll take one more question. Hi, my name is Alex Dougherty, and I am a junior at Suncoast Polytechnical High School in Sarasota. Um, I work with the Sea Alliance to distribute information about school board candidates to voters. If this movement pa passes, what type of 501c3 compliant information beyond political parties should be prioritized to educate voters on so that they can be prepared for elections? Well, thank you for that question. That's kind of a complicated one. Uh, Rod, any thoughts on that? Well, she's talking about a form of a nonprofit, mm -hmm. um, so they can't be partisan. If, I'm, if I got the 501c3 right, not an expert, we have lawyers for those things, but I believe that 501c3 can't be um, partisan, which means they have to be very careful in how they inform people. They can do what like the League of Women Voters does. Um, they can give out the information on it, they can, et cetera, just inform people on it, um, but they can't endorse, they can't say basically vote for or vote against. Well, we're going to uh, leave it there, but I want to thank our panelists so much. You've been listening to Jeff Solacek from Tampa Bay Times. He's an education reporter there. Rod Thompson, political strategist and chair of the Communications Committee with the Republican Party of Sarasota County. And Damaris Allen, executive director of Families for Strong Public Schools. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks also to Florida Matters executive producer Grayson Doctor and engineers Dave Anderson, Jackson Harp and Blake Bass. And thanks also to Mary Shedden, Leslie Laney, Steve Newborn and Chandler Balcom. And our audience at the WUSF Performance Studio in Tampa. I'm Matthew Petty and you can subscribe to Florida Matters wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.